terms of the acute response and the and the chronic response, like what's happening in the or sorry, not the chronic response, the um, I guess the you know the period after. We really have to be careful because we're we're at risk for injury if we're um, consecutively doing hit sessions, especially run based, too close together. Okay, so big um, training hours in our well-trained to elites, as we're all aware of. Um, but yeah, those these are generally the you know the physiological contr contributions to that uh, that success. So let's now look to hit, and we're going to move to chapter three in the in the book and course, and we're going to talk about a few of the targets of hit. So, of course, uh, it was Albert or someone else that that would have said, um, you know, everything should be made as simple as possible, but but not simpler. So we obviously there is a gazillion reactions and different things that are going on in from the physiological standpoint of exercise training. But if we broke it down and we made it really simple, which we should try to do, um, we've got we can with hit training, we can basically have three key targets. We can have a type of hit session that only challenges the aerobic system, so heart and lungs uh, and mitochondria. We can have a hit session that you know um, really just focuses mostly on the anaerobic system, so the blood lactic acid and uh, uh, lactic acid system and the glycogen system. And as mentioned, we can have also have a session that either does or does not really target the neuromuscular system. And the cool thing about HIT is that you can have almost any combination that you want. It's at your disposal if you know how to use the tools. That's very powerful from a programming standpoint if you want to optimize those, those systems and keep your athletes uh, both fit and healthy. So um, throughout HIT science, we kind of color these, uh, these the HIT sessions. Aerobic oxidative is, uh, is green anaerobic glycolytic is uh, red and black is our neuromuscular target. Okay. So just to be clear what we're talking about again, with the aerobic oxidative target, your, these are what's are ac actually occurring when, um, when an aerobic uh, oxidative session occurs. So there is a, a deoxygenation in the brain. You'll actually, you know, there's, this is actually one of the things that, uh, an athlete's going to benefit by is by that, that deoxygenation that actually occurs in the brain. It's hard. We've heard of time at VO2 max, and it may be an important aspect for, um, for performance optimization. And, and indeed, we often will program sessions so that we can, we can achieve long periods of time in that session at um, high, uh, at VO2 max, so longer times at VO2 max, we want to know the sessions that, that we need to do. That's really where my, my research started at UQ. I was really curious as what were the best sessions to do to lengthen the time you could do at VO2 max? How could we move the, the, you know, the variables of hit to achieve that objective? Because we know that we get maximal cardiac output, big stroke volumes, we improve the oxidative function ma ma um, maximally as well. So the, the big, large motor units, the large fast twitch muscle fibers, they are maximally recruited and, and they're we're making them more uh, slow twitch, right? So that's again, super important because they're powerful. And if we can make powerful muscles more fatigue resistant, then that's a great thing, obviously. And then lots of respiratory work gets done as well. Okay. Our, oxidative respiratory uh, di you know, diaphragm and intercostals. Of course, down at the aerobic enzymes, those are um, you know, the desaturation or uh, deoxygenation levels. The rebound is that we get more mitochondria or aerobic enzymes and those buffer. And uh, you know, again, these are all leading to the performance. That's the peripheral effect. That's the central effect. But um, almost you know, any hit session, well, no, sorry, I shouldn't say that. Uh, most hit sessions will target the aerobic system. The second one is that anaerobic. And this one does and doesn't apply to the triathlete. It certainly it hit, but we, we really need to be careful. It's not the be all end all. It's not gonna be um, one of the key factors that relates to a performance um, 
you know, win for a triathlete. Okay, but we have to be careful about this one. When, when we do a hit session, like a, like a VO2 max interval you might be familiar with, well, they're really hard and I'll show you an example in one sec. And, you know, we're gonna get big um, lactic spillover, lactate spillover. It's gonna manipulate glycogen stocks and reduce that because we're burning sugar in such a session. They're hard, so perceived exertion is high. And we do too many of these, we're gonna decrease the performance. So, you know, this also leads to a big sympathetic response. We really have to be careful with how much uh, anaerobic contribution is occurring in, in, our, uh, in our program. But again, HIT can be manipulated to actually have low amounts of that. That's the cool thing about it. The neuromuscular and musculoskeletal system is the last physiological target. Okay, so think about doing a session on the bike versus doing the session on the run and make it like the exact same hit session in your mind. You um, think you might, you might be aware that the same intensity done on the track versus or on the road versus the bike, you know, one of those sessions is going to leave you with a lot more residual fatigue. And it's likely the run because of that eccentric contraction versus the, the, the cycling, which is the, the concentric, concentric contraction, right? So they're totally different. And uh, knowing that is really powerful, again, when you're programming, because too much running and um, too much neuromuscular strain leads to injury risk, residual fatigue, perceived, um, you know, will certainly be a high perceived exertion and can definitely decrease performance. So hit. We can be very precise with it. We think hit is a little bit like your Navy SEAL or your Rambo. Okay, so we want to come in with a hit session and we want to be very targeted in our approach, like like Rambo is. Okay, like the Navy SEAL is. We don't want to come in all guns blazing. Uh, you know, like an Armageddon uh, session. It's not no pain, no gain. Although it can be, right? So this is an, a no pain, no gain uh, type session. They have their place, but we can also be much more targeted if we manipulate these right. So we can do a session that's just aerobic neuromuscular. We can have one that's just aerobic anaerobic, or we can come in all, all guns blazing, aerobic anaerobic neuromuscular. And this is, I recognize, we've been told a million times, this is a very busy schematic uh, roadmap on what you should, sorry, you, how you can kind of think about things from your, um, from a targeted plan. So this is our sort of our recipe that we recommend. So we've got our, you know, I appreciate your context first, and then we break out down all of our hit sessions into what we call hit types. So, and because you can have, you notice the color is now back. So you can have a hit session that is just targeting the metabolic O2 system. You can have one that's just targeting aerobic and neuromuscular. You can have a type three targeting aerobic anaerobic, but not neuromuscular. You can have one that's all guns blazing type four. You can remove the aerobic uh, component of it if done correctly as well. And it can be just anaerobic uh, lactic and neuromuscular or you could actually have one as well that is, you know, just gym based. It's not technically hit. And these are all the different formats that you would use to get to those, uh, those hit types, right? So these are, we're going to talk about some short intervals today, and we're going to talk about long intervals today, because those are the two most um, applicable hit sessions for the triathlon coach. Okay. So let's just begin with some, uh, I guess, a little bit of ch uh, work in chapter four. And just to put everyone on the same page in terms of exercise intensity. So when we're talking about exercise intensity, you can see the spectrum here at the very top. This is all out. So this is as fast as you can run, or this is as, most, as much power as you could possibly produce. But peak power or maximal sprinting speed is right at the top. And then at the bottom is your critical velocity, critical power, maximal lactate steady state, or FTP, whatever you want to call that down there. It's sitting, it's sitting down there, you know, sitting around, you know, 85% of VO2 max. It depends on, you know, how good your threshold is. 
Um, and then here you can see there's there's VO2 max sitting there. Um, yeah, and at the top, maximal sprinting speed or peak power. So this is the spectrum of hit. Remember, according to the definition that we're talking about, it's not mid zone training, and um, yeah, it's not it's not the group workout necessarily either. And you can see all the different formats that fall into line there. So we've got you know sprint interval training. These ones are done all out. Um, right to the, right to maximum for like 30 seconds on and then you know a four minutes off so big lactic response big neuromuscular response rst stands for repeated sprint training so these ones are just short sprints and these ones are also all out but because they're repeated a lot quicker they don't tend to go right to your maximal sprinting speed on the right also is our game-based high intensity interval training or small sided games, just to orient you so you know what that is. And that's also like, that's um, more team sport based. We won't be talking about those today. We will talk about our short intervals and our long intervals. These are, these are the two most applicable to the traf in the triathlon context. Yeah, so long and short. Okay, so again, what was, why is it important? Why is it important? Well. It's because you get to recruit your um, fast twitch muscle fibers, which, and if you're doing all mid zone or low, so um, if you're doing all, you know, L2 math training, you're just recruiting for the most part, these long, these slow twitch muscle fibers, right? Your type one fibers, which are great. We definitely want to have those ones maximized but we really kind of miss going into the, into the red zone and recruiting all these other fibers that we have at our, um, you know, that are available to be, to be almost, you know, turned into um, fibers that are more like your type one fibers. They're fatigue resistant. And that's the, one of the key purposes. So once you stimulate them, you get a, um, you know, you, you cause a shift in those to become more fatigue resistant. They don't lose their power uh, necessarily, and um, they become more functional as a, as a, as a high-end triathlete. Okay, so the first one, as mentioned for that, we're gonna, um, is, is the long interval. Okay, so you'll also know this one, a lot of people call these VO2 max intervals. Now, you know, if we're talking to others, we might kind of call them that um, VO2 max intervals as opposed to long intervals. Uh, so these tend to be done at your VO2 max power output. Okay, so sitting, you know, anywhere be, kind of between, you know, 95 and 105% of the end that you get at an incremental test. So you can do an incremental test without gas, without measuring gas, you can, you know, and, you, and it'll be about that. So say you're doing a ramp test, like 30 watts every minute, you could do that on your wind trainer and right, you know, the, where, where you max out was your incremental test. And so you'd be doing that right at that, that, um, that intensity, uh, anywhere from 95 to 105% of that. And you'd be doing that intensity for two to five minutes, right? Lots of ways to skin the cat, we like to say. And your recovery period, typically one to four minutes. Again, lots of ways to skin the cat. We recommend typically passive is best. Focus on the work effort, not uh, extra, not uh, intensity during the recovery period. If you're on the track, we recommend that you do kind of, you know, two minutes, two to three minutes walking uh, or, or an easy jog really to focus on the next rep is best practice. Again, for both of these, we're going to be eliciting either a type three or a type four response. So if it's a type three response, this is going to be more on a, on a cycle ergometer because we're, again, as mentioned with that example, we're lowering the neuromuscular strain. It's not as detrimental on our system. So it would be type four if we are on the track or on the road, whatever, um, because of that neuromuscular strain that's actually going to be occurring. Okay, so yeah, that's basically the long interval. We'll get Kyle. So this is one of my athletes, Kyle Buckingham uh, from South Africa. And we're just going to listen to him do his session here. So this one, four to six, the prescription is four to six by three minutes at VO2 max power, uh, two minutes recovery between the, the exercise bouts. And it's a real good primer of the neuromuscular system, but it's not neuromuscularly damaging. Again, you know, 
it's, it's, it's way different than if he was doing that on the track because he's not getting that, he's not getting that snap, snap, snap onto his legs, right? So, but they really sting, right? You can, you can hear that there. Big anaerobic dose, big, big lactic dose and a big, um, you know, we have to really be care cautious of how the athlete recovers in subsequent days. Okay, so standard microcycle, which could be of interest. Um, so this is just in one of his successful races. So for example, you know, 12 days out and that would be sort of sit right in there. So six by three minutes, um, I tend to, yeah, you've got to be cautious with these a little bit as we get closer to race time. But, you know, hitting a session like that is very, really is a real kind of confidence booster kind of coming up to the, uh, to the important, um, important event. Uh, and yeah, and, and again, as mentioned before, we can see all the different sessions there, but HIT is only one piece of the, of the training program puzzle. And again, that's why I notice our emblem here. It's a puzzle piece. So, you know, this is, we, we really look at training as a, as a puzzle. And yeah, and there's loads, you know, everyone's got their own way of kind of going at things, but we really take it, we try to take a physiological based approach and try to hit that as much as we can. So and we can also see, um, you know, some, some swimming uh, intervals that are occurring there as well. And the Ironman prep tracks that would also have some, some running intervals in it as well. So we have type, notice this one's a type four session because it has the running, uh, it's engaging the running. This one's here, we have a run after a, a big bike and that's um, even though it's a mid zone, mid zone bike, uh, kind of Ironman based uh, prep efforts. And then, but still neuromuscular based because of the long brick workout thereafter. Okay, and again, lots of ways to go at this. this is just one, one way that tended to work for us. The, the next hit session that we'll talk about is the short interval hit session. And the short interval hit session, um, you know, we hear is the most versatile of all the hit types. This one is really Martin's baby. He really did a, a, the bulk of the research in this one to manipulate a lot of the variables and figure things out. And, you know, I've really enjoyed it my, myself uh, learning about this one and it, I find it so powerful um, because look at all the different, uh, you know, hit types that you can actually have if you move the levers the right way. So it's a little higher in intensity, notice 100 to 120% of that incremental test score. So a little harder um, for, you know, and these can be anywhere from 10 to 60 seconds depending on the, you know, the physiological response that you're after. And then the rest duration is, is sort of similar as well. And the cool thing about these, I'm going to show you in a bit is well, you, you, you might be asking yourself, well, how can I move from a type one session to like a type two session? Um, well, the answer is really this, this cool physiological protein that sits in our muscles. It's called myoglobin. I'm sure you've heard of hemoglobin, which is the, you know, the red blood cell carrier from your, um, you know, your lungs to your cells and around the circulatory system. But less of us have heard about myoglobin, even though it's a very similar protein and it sits in the muscle cell and it becomes resaturated super quickly within 10 seconds, 10 to 20 seconds, it's totally resaturated. And as a result, um, by having like, when we compare here a 60 second interval versus a 60 second interval, we can totally change how much anaerobic metabolism actually goes on in that session, even if they're done at the same intensity because of this really, this real uh, resaturation, rapid resaturation of the myoglobin that's just sitting in your muscle cell. Okay, so by put, by pausing, by not letting the exercise intensity go on for too long, but then having a quick, uh, quick recovery and then a, a lengthened recovery, you can totally actually make a, a hit session at VO2 max, but yet with a blood lactate of only four. Now that's crazy. When we first figured out, or sorry, when we first uh, um, read about that, that was Salton in 1960, they've known about that. We first, uh, you know, read that work, we were just blown away that it was, this is so cool and, and super, super useful. So Take a look here. Look at these sessions. These ones are, you know, still done at VO2 max, but on the on the y-axis here, we have the blood lactic response. Anyone that's ever done any work in the lab would know that, you know, your typical blood lactic um, 
that you lactic response that you get to at the end for longer intervals, it tends to be, you know, even higher than a six or eight or, or 10 or 12. But these ones here, these 10 on 10 offs or 20 on or 20 off, you can be sitting near VO2 max, but yet only have a rate of lactic uh, concentration of four. So pretty low, very manageable. You can totally back that session up the next day. So short intervals are super powerful and the most versatile. Lots of ways to do it. Here's uh, Scott Babel, an athlete I, I don't coach anymore, but I, um, I coached him from, a, you know, uh, I guess a young junior, a guy was, uh, was doing lower end triathlon and he's, you know, he's, he's a pro now. And he's, I think he just came fifth in, in Cannes. So this is him demonstrating a type three uh, short interval. Okay, this is 30 seconds on. 30 seconds off. And this one's used, we use this one a lot and it's a real, it's a great one for digging in. Remember 120% of that power. So you really get those nice lifts and those gains. You just have a look at the, um, the response here in both the, notice the heart rate. You get a heart rate um, lag and a heart rate inertia that occurs in this. The heart rate almost kind of comes up into the threshold range. But the V, you know, the power for each one of those 30 seconds is much higher than it typically is during, uh, you know, normal training. So Scott just dug nicely into his fast twitch muscle fibers, obviously there, and uh, he's going to get the buffering response accordingly. So he's building the mitochondria in the larger motor units by doing that session. So again, it's it's very lactic based. And you can see he's breathing hard as well, right? So we wanted both of those responses. Yeah, and, and then keep it going, that's right. Um, Andy, Andy Busher, another athlete I coach, um, is, uh, this is him doing the run short interval, 40 on, 20 off. These ones are kind of more type three, type four response. So again, it's run based, but it's treadmill. So treadmill is, you're, you're, you're coming off the neuromuscular load a little bit there. But again, very similar. And again, 40 on, 20 off, very, uh, very powerful, um, you know, uh, interval session. So uh, notice also the, the recovery period between those sets, right? So, you know, three, three minutes of easy steady. So it's, it's almost a long interval, but it's still broken. So um, yeah, I, I'm, I highly recommend the use of the, the short interval. I find great success with it, bled in with, with a, an appropriate level of, uh, you know, mid zone or mid zone and, and, and L2 work. Now, we also cover surveillance like training loads. I think of your performance management chart that sits in training peaks. And we also um, cover the load response, chapter nine. So think about heart rate variability, think about morning resting heart rate. But what I find is that those are quite complex and, um, you know, one thing that I have, uh, I guess this is really the development of the app. This is why we've, we've kind of come across with this app is that they're, I find they're quite complex topics. I've made way too many mistakes with the whole thing. And this is really what's put me towards pushing the development of Athletica, which will be kind of coming out in, um, yeah, very, you know, very soon. We're really close to, close to launch, not quite yet. But we're in the we're re, we're looking for uh, you know astute uh, athletes and coaches that can help us make it make it better to come on as beta testers and that's my pitch to you if anyone's interested in this if they can contact me um, but yeah these are the you've, I'm sure you've seen your performance management chart and and a lot of it makes uh, some sense but not perfect sense and it's a lot there's a lot of ways we can make mistakes along the way I've found at least. And I was, those mistakes are maddening to me. I don't like letting my athletes down. Uh, so I wanted to build something that would take some of the heavy lifting out of the whole process for me. And I'm looking for more coaches that kind of feel that way and want that too, because as, as you'll know, there's a lot more to coaching than just the, just the um, you know, just the monitoring and just the, just the content. Um, there's a lot of emotional and uh, psychological aspects that we have to deal with as well. And I want to free up more of your bandwidth to be able to do that. 
So yeah, uh, my pitch to you is to help me help me make um, Athletica even better. And we're seeking beta testers for this new training platform that I have the privilege of uh, of working on with my colleagues. So contact me at info at Hit Science if if this is of any interest to you. Um, so that's about it for me. I've gone pretty close to time. Forty minutes of a presentation. Uh, remember to con uh, get in, Rob's going to be giving more information on a discount for the course. We want as many people to take our course and, and read our book as possible um, so that they understand these principles. And, and again, we also hope that Athletic will take some of this heavy lifting out in the future and, and assist more coaches uh, to, to be better at their jobs. So Rob, I'm um, not sure if you're there, but um, that's it for me, bud. Yep. No, fa fantastic. Uh, thank you ever so much for that, Paul. That's uh, that's brilliant. Um, we've had uh, some some questions um, start to to come in. Um, so I think uh, if I start off with with Paul, um, you, you've put quite a long question on there, uh, Paul. Would you like to just unmute yourself and and um, uh, Paul Loring uh, and ask Paul uh, a little bit more about uh, your question there. Uh, okay, um, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Paul. Um, yeah, my concern is that as a level one coach, we're more or less tra tra trained to think about doing the traditional periodization model but increasingly people are reading things like sweet spot training uh, and HIT. And HIT, of course, as you've described it as a term, is used all over the place in all the media, you know, how to get slim, how to get strong and what have you. So it's very confusing about what I as a coach should now be doing when it comes to training essentially age groupers rather than elite athletes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and particularly the role of um, the, the, the endurance aspects of zone two of long distance training um, in terms of forming a, a base and maintaining that base through the, um, the periodization. Yeah, yeah I, I really, um, I totally feel your frustration, Paul, with the, the confusion that's kind of been caused um, out there. That was never the intent of coaches in the 1920s when they first um, came across this. So it was all started on the, on the track and in, in runners. That's, um, but you know, uh, that's what media has, has done. And it, it's, it's taken that, that term and, and they've run with it. Um, us as coaches, I think we just have to think a little bit more traditionally and uh, stick with the correct definition. And that's, I think what I've presented today and then with all, you know, how do you, I think your question really relates to, well, how do I apply? I've got all these tools that I've learned about. I've learned about sweet spot training. I've learned about L2 training and I'm learning about HIT training now. Well, where do they all kind of fit? And again, that is, you know, there's, uh, sadly, there's lots of ways to skin the cat. There's no right or wrong answer, but there's a few fundamental principles and some of them relate around the individual. You can't hit or smash an individual too often. You need to use the principle of progression. So everyone can do hit, but everyone is at their own level of progression. Like almost everyone can do one bout, one rep, one short burst, do you know what I mean? Without getting injured. And um, that is, that's really where you need to start. So you need to know the athlete that sits in front of you and what they're capable of and then you know and you do that through those conversations and then you can apply your you know um i guess your ultimately your formula this is again this is this comes back to athletic and what we're trying to create is we're trying to also create an educational um you know platform to educate coaches and athletes as well uh, on on these sorts of items so there's no one, I'm sure you've heard of the polarization uh, principle. So there is an 80-20 generalization on how much low intensity work versus high intensity work should be in your program. That's a good uh, you know, rule of thumb to kind of try to follow. 
but it's it's not a, an exact science either. And again, it's still context based. It depends on the person that you have in front of you. But I um, I've seen more success with that eighty generally eighty twenty or ninety ten approach. So the bulk of it, low intensity, low stress, L two fat burning workouts or exercise, but still hitting interval training, even in your so-called base period, which is against tradition. But I believe that, you know, there's a lot of studies that have shown that even just a regular once a week hit of the, of the hit session is highly beneficial. Athletes come back much stronger in the, when they start and kick back up more in their, you know, towards their build, build work when they have that in the off season too. Thank you for that clarification. That's very helpful. Pleasure. Um, so if we move on, uh, we've, we've got quite a, a, a long question um, here from, from Lewis. Uh, Lewis, would you like to just unmute yourself and uh, go through what you'd like to, to ask Paul? Yes, definitely. Thank you, uh, Paul. And um, I have been following your work for pretty quite some time and it's really interesting and uh, it's a pleasure to hear your presentation. Um, I have a question. Uh, I've been reading your book and you talk about prescribing exercise, uh, hit high intensity interval training based off the VO2 max percentage, like 100%. And there's a spectrum that you actually showed going from critical velocity all the way to maximum sprinting speed. Um, and I think you kind of answered the question in the in the uh, in that slide where you talk about that it's about eighty five percent of uh, or something like that. Um, the VO two max pace is about eighty five percent, or I mean I would say the critical velocity. Sorry, it's eighty five percent of the of the VO two max pace. Is that right? Yeah, it's there about so. Yeah, I'm not sure. Are you still seeing my slide team? Yes, yes. Uh, Perfect. So there, I think this is really your question is relating to this. So there is your critical velocity, critical power, maximal lactate steady state, functional threshold power. Yeah. So it's right down there. Mm -hmm. and that That is sitting below your VO2 max. Your VO2 exactly. max is above that. Yeah, so you might be sitting around 85% of that when you're looking at your... FTP because FTPs we can objectively measure that can't we we can we can do an FTP test right exactly yes. yeah which is kind of useful so it's a good way to kind of calibrate your sessions through that um, exactly. the other marker if you want to get a good marker of um, the velocity or power that's associated with VO2 max I did this work with Mark Quad David Martin and Dave, uh, and um, Jim Martin at the AIS in 2010, we published it. And we showed in your Australian cyclists, elite cyclists, that typically a, uh, a four minute maximal mean power is also, is, is almost spot on your VO2 max power. And, and we, we start to see similar to, you know, a similar like with your, your all out mile time as to, and, or, or if you can kind of like do a mile on the track or 1500 meters, you're going to be kind of in the ballpark of where your your um, you know your your v your the velocity associated with that is too. So these are other good um, good indicators of where that that VO two max uh, power and speed are sitting. But yeah, okay. that I, yeah. again we're 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 just ballparking. So you don't you know if if you're out a couple percent, it's actually it's not the be all end all. And mm -hmm. this is why actually I don't, I don't tend to prescribe. I know this is a little different than a lot of coaches. I don't tend to prescribe an actual power or velocity. I prescribe like um, a feel Range. And, I, and, and I leave the intensity open because that enables both the training response, like the training, the natural inclination to improve and adapt. And, or, and it also, um, uh, will cater for the athlete that is being critiqued as well, right? Like they're, or they're overreached, they won't do as much, but they're still going to be safe and they won't fail. So yeah, I just tend to leave that power and speed open. The more you do them, the more comfortable you get. Like there's a whole learning um, response that actually occurs with that, with the whole process too. Yeah. But, yeah, I hope I answered a little bit of your question there. 
Um, yeah, I think that that makes a lot more sense because uh, at least in swimming, I've seen that they the research has um, related the velocity of VO2 max or something similar to the one 400 meter swim. And I recently have been using that with a bunch of uh, swimmers in in college. And uh, they, I've been using the three minute test actually. So they go all out and then at the end of the test, they level out to a critical velocity. However, now, now knowing the critical velocity, uh, I was like wondering, so, so what is the, v, the velocity of VO2 max? How much percentage of that? And if, it, if I can kind of get somewhere, in, like you mentioned, in the fields of either 85% or 95% and divide it or something from that percentage, I can kind of get something of the 400 meter freestyle pace, I would guess. Um, just, yeah. I mean, I was just figuring out and trying to say how that could be used in more detail. Yeah, well, again, so for me, I use critical swim speed, yeah. uh, the swim smooth uh, sort of formula. I find that's quite nice. Of course, we're getting threshold there with critical swim speed. Mm -hmm. uh, I find that I find that quite useful. Remember also with VO2 max um, that there's these this, we, you know, we haven't had time to go into it, but there's this whole thing called the anaerobic speed reserve. And basically yes. it's the fact that different athletes are going to have different components or, or different makeups of slow and fast twitch fibers. So someone with a great amount of fast twitch fibers, they're going to have a big anaerobic speed reserve. In other words, this arrow here up here is going to be super high versus our diesel engines. They got nothing down here. It's super small. Like they, you know, they, they really don't go too much into that. The maximal sprinting speed isn't that much greater than their VO2 max speed. So it really, uh, you know, there's things that are kind of masking it here. And it's why we can really only, we can only ballpark in there. And we're, exactly. yeah, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, we're just limited. We don't really know where, where it is, but whether it even matters is, is another factor too, right? Like it's, Yes. Uh, I think ballparking is actually fine on that one. And it's fine, I think, also to use either your critical swim speed, your um, maximal, your FTP, or, you know, your, maybe your Jack Daniels equivalent in the, in the run, your VDOT um, equivalent for 15K, say, for example. Okay. Yeah, I, I get it now. And thank you very much for your contribution here. Oh, you're welcome, Liz. Cheers. Thank you, Lewis. Um, I, I'd just like to, to jump forward uh, a little bit on, on some of these questions. Uh, Sebastian's asked a, a question in relation to HIT and older triathletes, um, because we also had a, um, a couple of questions come in on the, the registration forms, uh, asking the same thing in, in relation to uh, the older athlete, the master's athletes. Um, so what sort of things... Um, uh, first of all, would you be prescribing uh, HIT to some of the older triathletes, Paul? And um, what sort of things uh, should be avoided or, or what should be uh, adjusted? Yeah, so again, we're, we're all individuals. We're, and there's, you know, there's a lot of older individuals who are absolute animals. You'll know that. And they can totally handle uh, the hit sessions like, and then conversely, we have to, uh, we have to be, uh, certainly careful with some. So it really, it really depends on the person that sits in front of you and common sense always wins out. Um, so hopefully everyone appreciates that, but make no mistake about it, that the, you know, hit exercise is, um, has been shown across to be successful across all populations from, the uh, you know overweight and obese to the elderly, and it's also often thought of as a more enjoyable uh, exercise format. Um, and it's really important from a health standpoint too in the elderly because don't don't forget one of the key things that you know is all happening to all of us as we age is our inability to get in and recruit those larger fast twitch muscle fibers. We slowly lose that ability as we age. So the longer we can keep engaging those uh, from a recruitment standpoint, the longer we're going to hold on to abilities of strength and uh, the ability to, uh, you know, things like balance and you know, the ability to prevent a fall. So it's, yeah, it's, um, 
it done in the correct uh, approach with the right progression. We can all start somewhere, but where is that point? Let's not be silly about the prescription for someone that's just getting off the couch and just starting into this. We need to take a completely different approach than some of the amazing, you know, 50 or 60 year old um, guys that are trying to qualify for Hawaii, right? So it, it really is a, a wide range arrangement of everyone. So common sense rules for everyone. Thank you, Paul. Um, I've got a question here that I, I, it's, it's a bit more of a sort of general question, um, but it's, it's come in uh, on the registration forms. And, and I ask it because th this person is in their final year doing their university final year project uh, on the effects of various interval training protocols and endurance training on performance and a variety of health markets. So um, they're a member of one of our local triathlon clubs um, and they've asked, what are the what are the benefits uh, of HIT compared to traditional in, endurance training? What what's the what's the the key messages which uh, which you'd give out as the importance for for doing yeah. HIT training? Super question, yeah. And I really I, mean, I probably skipped over that and didn't make it really clear. We look at the physiological responses to HIT. There are two key things that you get with a HIT session that you do not get with an L two session you get a large ventricular contraction response. You get this big preload, big stroke volume in your heart that you're not gonna get at the same level if you're doing your easy steady state L2 work. So cardiovascular wise, and that's where you, you, know, you see the, the big heavy breathing and, and you know, all the guys that I, that I gave the demos in the video, they were all breathing hard. So there was maximal you know, cardiac recruitment, heavy you know, respiratory work going on. So centrally, we get a big central um, adaptation. And again, we are, I'm sure you've seen some of the graphs. The other thing from aging, we're trying to prevent the fall of that um, heart work, the, the, the cardiovascular work. We don't wanna lose our VO2 max. So that's the big, that's the first one. And the second one is, it, I had mentioned it a couple of times, the larger recruitment of the um, of the fast twitch muscle fibers, right? So these ones right here, you're getting into these fast twitch muscle fibers, the white fibers, and you're making them more oxidative, right? You're you're turning them on, you're adding capillary density, and you're telling them, no, you're still working. We're we're not turning you off. And if you were going to sit on your duff, unfortunately, they just you know they um, they shrivel up, and we just can't get into them anymore. So we want to be able to recruit those as well. So those are the main two factors. Cardiovascular response that you wouldn't get on L2, fast twitch muscle fiber response that you wouldn't get with L2. Um, that's just, again, I mean, the health, the health bits, I mean, the psychological, the social, uh, the, or the, um, uh, like the emotional response that you get. They've, uh, there's another study that's shown a benefit in, the, um, in your immune response. I mean, the list is endless, right? Like you're really, we were meant to, we're meant to work hard as, as humans evolving. So yeah, um, again, the, the one last point I'll make is you can get too much of a good thing. That's an important, another important principle. So you can overdo this. And again, if we go to the CrossFit example, that can be detrimental. So that's, um, you know, caution always with this, but or, you know, a, a dose in the right amount for the right person with the appropriate recovery following is meant. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so we've got one of our uh, local uh, teachers uh, here, Claire, who, who's asked a, a question. Um, Claire, do you, do you just want to unmute yourself and, and uh, add a bit of clarity around what you'd like Paul to yeah, sure. Thanks, Paul. That was a good session. So my year 12s were here listening with me. Um, in the study design, you've got HIIT training and then you've got other training methods such as short interval training. Um, they often get confused with identifying a HIIT session compared to short interval with work to rest ratios and the intensity and the duration. Just wondering if you can say the key points that they should be looking for to tell the difference between a HIIT session and a short interval session. Sure. Well, a HIIT session... Uh, like a short interval session is a type of hit session. 
So that is um, just to be clear when we're looking, yeah, when we're looking at like all the different types of hit sessions, um, they're right here. And these are, um, so these are all hit sessions technically. So long intervals, short intervals, repeated short sprints, repeated long sprints, small sided games. So technically speaking, because they're all above our critical velocity, maximal lactate steady state in our red zone, they are still technically hit. That's its definition. That's sort of where we started. The short intervals, again, they're, uh, if we want to compare long and short intervals, then we can compare, you know, here's your typical, um, I'll start with the long one. The long interval was typically the, you know, two to five minutes works. These are your typical VO2 max intervals. And then their recovery bout should be, you know, one to four minutes. Uh, and, you know, you can repeat that for as, as much as is appropriate for the individual in terms of the how many consecutive bouts.